All right. Okay. Hello, Buff Nation, and welcome to a very special interview. I have with me here CU women's basketball head coach for 22 seasons, four-time Big 8 coach of the year, and 1995 Carol Ekman Award recipient, Seal Berry. Thank you for being here. Hi, Aiden. It's good to be here. Good to be here with you. Yeah, so I figured we would uh, we'd talk a little bit and tell people about the significance of Title IX and exactly what your role and uh, participatory nature in that was. So if we could um, go back uh, a little bit, um, I just want, I was just wondering what it was like being a part of that sort of initial wave, bringing female athletics to the forefront at CU. Well, uh, prior to Title IX uh, being passed in 1972, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities for women, uh, not only in athletics, uh, but also in other professions. They weren't admitted to med school, law school, Ivy League school, participated in the military. There were, you know, kind of, I have an older sister who kind of, when she went to school, when she went to college, it was pretty much, you know, who are you going to get married to? You leave college and get married. And the joke was you get your MRS degree. So, you know, that era of, of the United States in the late 60s, early 70s was a big time of change for women that, yes, you can go to med school, you can go to law school, and Title IX provided that. And it just so happened, it said, oh, by the way, if the university is receiving, has a contract with the federal government for Pell Grants and scholarships, um, you know, you better have a basketball team for women if you have a basketball team for men, or you better have a golf team for women if you have a golf team for men. And at the end of the day, the participation rate in the athletics department had to mirror what the student enrollment was by gender. So if there were 55% males attending CU and 45% females attending CU, then the participation rate in the athletic men had to mirror that. So it was an interesting time, Aiden, because at first athletic directors thought, oh no, we're going to go broke. You know, the, those women's sports are going to run us out of business. We're not going to have money. Women's, uh, women's sports going to run football out of business. We won't have college football. And yet, here we are 50 years later, football is doing well. Football is doing really well in all parts of the country. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you can talk a little bit about before title nine, what uh women's sports looks like at a university level. Well, if at CU, for example, in most, most institutions, women's sports were run out of intramurals and recreation or out of the physical education department. There were phys ed departments and you get a phys ed instructor who might coach the field hockey team. Um, at CU, at my school, University of Kentucky, it was in the intramural and recreation department. So the recreation, you get a, a, a women's intramural and recreation director and her job was to field teams in the sports that the girls that the women were interested in. There were no budgets whatsoever for travel, for uniforms, for shoes, for coaching. There wasn't anything uh, even remotely close to something like a sports bra for women or women's basketball shoes. There were they they didn't exist. And so um did those you, teams sorry uh did those teams travel at all? Well we did we did travel. Okay. We traveled locally when I played. Uh, I played back in Kentucky. We traveled Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, any place you could get to in a car. Um, at okay. CU, CU competed against schools um, that were on the front range, Wyoming, Colorado College, Regis, Metro. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, Air Force did not admit women until the I, th I think the early 80s, I'd have to look that up exactly, but mostly a local schedule, Western State, 
um, you know, driving to schools. They didn't fly off to Iowa State or Texas and play those schools. So, yeah, you know, the, so the travel, the competition wasn't as robust because there, there was just not the budget, the travel budget available for women to get to go play at the same pace that the men did, did nor did they have a gym. Women weren't allowed in the event center or in the field house. They, there was actually on campus and the old Carlson gym used to be called the men's gym. So the men went to Carlson, the women went to the women's gym. How CU handled uh, Title IX and how that compared uh, to other universities' experience uh, with Title IX in the early days? Well, it's interesting. Uh, CU didn't, uh, it didn't come easily because CU was struggling with their football program. In the late 70s, uh, there was a coach uh, here, and I think the record over a, the three-year period was seven and 26, so he was losing, and which meant that we were losing money. We were hemorrhaging money. And so, unfortunately, because the football program was losing and the athletics department was losing money, the athletic director and the president cut seven sports and five of those sports were men and two, two of those sports were women's sports, women's gymnastics and women's diving were cut, but men's baseball, men's gymnastics, men's wrestling. Well, the women got blamed for that. Title IX got blamed for all those sports being cut. And in reality, the women's Title IX and the women should not have been blamed for the financial problems that the football team was having. Every athletics department across the country was implementing Title IX. They all were. They all had the same challenge of bringing on women's sports. But it, they, they came along. Uh, eventually, um, I was the first female head coach uh, in 1983, although Rainy Portland was here in 1979, but begrudging at first for CU, but eventually, you know, they liked the fact that we started winning and the first sellout at the event center was a women's game. Not very many people know that. There were over 11,200 people and it was an NCAA tournament game. So all of those tickets were sold. They were not giveaways. They weren't handing out, standing on the street corner, handing out free tickets. So when our team started to win, we added, we were adding more sports. We added women's golf in 94. We added women's volleyball in 86. We added women's soccer in 96. We added lacrosse, I think in 2011 or 2012. Um, CU came around just like most schools came around. They started to come around think. Boy, these women kind of add to the program. And they started adding more women's staff, more female staff members. For a long time in the 80s, I was the only professional exempt woman, uh, which was fine. They treated me very nicely, very well. But they started to hire more women in the department, which was which was nice and good for good for the department. So you talked a little bit about how they've kind of got more confident and added more sports as the decades progressed. I'm just wondering what kind of uh, uh, what the program kind of looked like and how it grew over the years between the 80s and 90s. Well, we had an excellent athletic director by the name of Bill Morold, who came in 1984. And his first sport that Bill, Bill added, women's volleyball, 1986. And he hired an excellent coach, a guy named Brad Sandin. And uh, volleyball caught on quickly. Uh, Nebraska was really good in women's volleyball. Uh, so Bill added volleyball, and we had some success with Big 8 championships in volleyball. So women's basketball was winning Big 8 championships. Women's volleyball was winning championships. Football was winning championships. So life was pretty good to be a buff in 1989, 1990. So then in 1994, Bill added uh, women's golf. We had a women's golf team because we had a men's golf team. And uh, we hired Justy Ray Miller. She came on and was our head coach. And then uh, right about the time Bill Morolt left, I believe he was on board. We had, we had plans to add women's soccer because soccer, you know, soccer was becoming super popular 
And uh, we had a women's soccer in 1996. Go backwards a little bit. I'm wondering, so the first, uh, the first few years, what were the biggest, what was the biggest struggle for you as head coach? Was it recruitment or was it more of the gridlock? Oh, no, no, no. I was 100% supported at CU. Matter of fact, there was an administrator from another, another school who told me, don't take that job at CU. It's, it's not, a, uh, they won't support you. Well, that didn't happen. I got 100% support to be successful here. My biggest uh, challenge uh, was recruiting. I had to recruit, get, get players and build the program. Fortunately, there were a couple of real good in-state players, Tracy Tripp and Bridget Turner. And they played for the Colorado Aspen club team. I brought them in here and they were the, they were really the foundation of the women's program in 1985. They came in here, started building the program. I'm just wondering uh, as over the years, cause you were obviously uh, head coach here from the eighties all the way into the two thousands. And I mean, you still oversaw the department uh, even in the past decade. I'm just wondering your thoughts on how the game has changed or how um, your, uh, if you were to be a head co co back and be head coach, um, how your position might've changed. Well, I think one of the things is this conference, the conference has changed. Um, we played in a great conference, the big eight conference, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, Kansas state, Iowa state, those schools supported their athletics department, you go in to sell out crowds at Iowa State. Um, Missouri was the, the, these were feverish sort of athletic departments, and it was a good fit for Colorado. Colorado was somewhat the glamour school of the Big Eight. Then we expanded in 1996 and we went to the Big 12 and added the Texas schools. The Texas schools kind of changed, changed the complexion of our conference. The conference office moved to Dallas, um, and the Texas school had a lot of sway in the in the AD conference room. Texas, Baylor, Texas A&M, and, and then uh, about 20, uh, I can't remember, 2010 or so, we moved to the Pac-12. That was a game changer, I think, in terms of recruiting. Uh, no longer were we the glamour school. You know, the, we were the glamour school, Boulder, you know, in, in the big eight, big 12. Now you have Stanford, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, really harder to recruit. In my opinion, your whole recruiting footprint changes to the West coast. And so that I think, I think makes it very, very difficult for the, for our coaching staff to recruit a different style of athlete and to compete against the West coast schools. The, state of uh, women and their and women's sports at CU has changed since uh, the 70s and 80s. And I'm wondering what you think the next step is for women's sports at CU. Well, I think at this point, we, we have met the participation ratio of 55 to 45. When I left as senior women administrator, we couldn't have been closer. About 55% male, 45% female. We mirrored the uh, a student population, we were we were close in scholarships. I I think it all boils down to recruiting, Aiden. It's getting high level players. Probably what I worked at the hardest when I was coaching was bringing the best players to the University of Colorado women's basketball and in make it a top ten program and something that our fans would really really enjoy seeing. When Jody Conrad brought her Texas Longhorns here, or Marion Washington brought her Kansas Jayhawks here, or Kim Mulkey brought Baylor here. We have big crowds, seven, 8,000. And it was, it was two top 20 teams playing each other. And you have to recruit. You have, you have to have the players. You can't go out there and the battle and not have the players to play against those teams. In your, in your post head coach state, uh, when you come, when you come back to see you, um, what is it like returning to Boulder? Well, you know, I, I will always remember those heydays of the big eight when Brad Sand Sandin was coaching volleyball and Bill McCartney was coaching football and I was coaching women's basketball. And, uh, 
we were winning a lot. And that's what, I guess my bar is high. My expectation level is high. Uh, Cause we, we have a, we have the most beautiful campus in the world. And um, I, I think we're in a great conference and television is more involved. And, you know, I, I think as any Buff fan, uh, the expectations are high and, and it should be, should be high. We want to keep it high. Yes. And we want to hopefully live up to those expectations. That's right. That's right. You keep the bar high and you recruit to that and you have a vision and it's, uh, it's fun for everybody involved. Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess my last question that I want to ask you, it's uh, kind of an open-ended question, but uh, I'm just wondering for you, uh, what does it mean to be an athlete today? And how does that compare to when you started coaching? Well, I think these younger athletes, both boys and girls, uh, specialize. And it's a little bit more of a business. There, there's a monetary reward involved for uh, elite level athletes. For girls, they can play professionally in so many more uh, sports. I, I hope they're still having fun. I watched the WNBA championships the other night. Looked like they are having a pretty good time. There's nothing like winning. So I think what's similar is that there's nothing better than working hard as a group, um, as, a, as a part of a team and to be part of that inner circle. There's nothing better than that. Um, on the downside, you hope that you don't lose people along the way because it's too stressful, um, that it's um, not fun anymore, um, that 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 innocence of playing sports isn't lost. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for, uh, you know, taking the time to be with us. Uh, it was an honor to meet you and to get to talk with you. And uh... Same to you. Good luck in your journalism career. I'll be looking for you. <laughs>